Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and how much we all loathe the publication process. At a corner table by the fire are two people. One of them is saying, no, 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 don't get me started on the publication process. No, seriously, don't get me started. And that's me, uh, Matthew Melema. And welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here at Believe to See, we explore the relationship between faith, art, and storytelling. Our goal is to help you connect the great story, the great stories, and our own stories in order to understand what it means to live with a Christian imagination. Now, as I just mentioned in my intro, uh, we talk a lot about stories on this podcast. And for many storytellers, part of telling their story involves seeking out the publication process. And if you've ever listened to any earlier podcasts involving me or Evangeline or Mandy or, well, pretty much any writer, you'll know that we love to complain about the publication process. Now, part of that is that writers oftentimes just like to complain about stuff. But another part is that the publication process is really tough. This can especially be the case for folks writing in the YA uh, section, section, genre. Well, it's not a genre. We'll get into that. But why a young adult fiction? As you'll hear from our author today, there are some pretty particular pitfalls that can make this process especially trying, especially if you want to write a story that is both true to the art and true to your Christian values. And our author has, well, been through this process and has her book all published now. The book is called Moon Thief. The author is Rachel Shinnick, and she is joining me here at the table. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Matthew, I'm so honored. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's start with the basics. Uh, of course, I want to hear about your book. But before that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are podcasting to us from Italy right now. <laughs> well, my name is Rachel Shinnick. Um, I am currently in Italy working with a missions movement called Youth with a Mission. Um, so been in missions for the past four years now, which is crazy. Um, I'm American, lived all over in the States, was born in Minnesota, lived in California, then North Carolina, then Florida, then Hawaii, then here. So my dad's a football coach for college football. So we moved around a lot growing up. Um, I consider North Carolina home though, because that's where I spent most of the time. And like my home church is there. Um, but, and yeah, I've now been in Italy for about two years, which is crazy. The Lord, I felt the call to missions on my life when I was like 14 years old. And when I said yes to missions, I thought I was saying yes to moving to Africa. And then he led me to Hawaii and now Italy. And I'm like, God, you know, I'll go anywhere for you, right? But <laughs> loving being here and even getting to see what God's doing in Europe through the arts and now with writing, there's some fun stuff there that I totally see God's fingerprint in. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the writing. So, uh, like I mentioned briefly earlier, your your YA novel is, is out now, a uh, Moon Thief. So, tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So, the story of Moon Thief actually initially the initial inspiration for it came about twelve years ago, and I remember the moment so vividly. I was I was in high school, and we were driving back from our we had like a worship night at our church, so it was night out. And I was sitting in the back seat of our Astro Brown van, and I'm looking out the window at this full moon, just marveling it, like taking in the night's beauty. And all of a sudden, the moon vanishes from my perspective. And my brain knew, like, it's just the tall North Carolina pines that are blocking it from my view. But my imagination started to spin like a completely different story. And it was a story that started with a question of what would happen if the moon crashed, shattered into the earth into a million pieces? Who would put it back together again? And it was this like initial seed that became what now is Moon Thief. Um, I didn't actually start writing it until about... It was uh, eight years ago now, so I was in college, and I had a Christmas break where I didn't have any school assignments, and for some reason decided, like, I'm going to spend my Christmas break writing. <laughs> and it was, this story had started to grow over the years to where I kind of had a vague outline of what was going to happen, and I knew who the characters were, um, I knew their personalities, and they just started growing so vibrantly in my imagination that it 
it kind of just felt like this urge of like, I have to write this. Um, and my initial motivation for writing it wasn't to publish at all. It was just, I want to read this to my kids one day. This is a really fun story that I don't want to forget. And I want to be able to read to my kids one day. So I started writing it down. And for the next three years, it was kind of my back pocket project. I pulled it out during Christmas break and spring break and summer break and would just work on it in the in-between moments. And then suddenly had this, well, suddenly, three years later, had a rough draft. Um, and I had a friend, I got connected with a friend who she had both been published and self-published. And so I had lots of like insight into the industry. And I asked her if she would go through and give feedback. So she went through chapter by chapter and gave like pivotal feedback. And really, if Moon Thief has like um, a midwife, it's, it's her. <laughs> she helped me give birth to this story and helped it shape, like, come together and have its shape. Um, and I probably worked with her for... I think it was like two years because it was both of our schedules. So she would like go through a chapter and I would make changes and she'd go through another chapter. Um, and about So two years after she started working with it, I ran into another friend and he he's not a writer, but he's one of those people that's kind of just a creative genius and everything he does, he does excellently. And you like want his opinion on anything you do because like, you know, he'll give you good feedback. And he loves story, loves fantasy, loves movies. We'd kind of connected over different stories. And I was just like, hey, would, would you go through and give feedback? And so he went through chapter by chapter and gave feedback and really helped helped me connect what was in my imagination to what was actually on paper. Which now when I talk to people who are writing, I'm like, I think my biggest feedback I can give to the process is inviting other people in. People who you trust and like when they tell you something, you know, like, okay, I value your opinion and who also will be kind with you because it hurts, but that you'll take their feedback because I saw the story of Moon Thief grow so much through these two voices kind of helping me shape and, and form and so then, so now at this point, it's like January of 2021. Um, and I have, I have this manuscript that multiple people have gone through and helped me edit. And so then it proposes the question, well, well, what do you do with it? I've just been writing for my kids, but I've spent a lot of time and effort in it. So like, is, is, am I going to try? I played around with the idea of self-publishing just to kind of get it out there, um, but wasn't really motivated to do anything with it until I was going through this devotional. And the question that the devotional asked to process with the Lord was to ask God, God, what's the impossible you want to do through me? And at this point, I knew I was heading to Italy to work with YWAM here and work with Youth with a Mission here. Um, and so I thought God was going to start putting on my heart's dreams about doing things in Italy. But I sit down and I ask God, like, okay, God, what's the impossible you want to do through me? And I just feel like he says, publish Moon Thief. To which I laughed and said, no, that's impossible. <laughs> and I felt like God laughed and was like, yeah, that's what you asked me. <laughs> it's like, oh, right. Um, and it was from that point that I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's see what this whole publishing thing looks like. I had no idea about the process at this point. So did lots of research of how do you get published for context, for those of you guys who don't know, typically in order to be traditionally published, you have to find an agent so that the agent will represent you to a publishing company. And in order to get an agent, you have to write something that's called a query letter, which basically is your book synopsis with a personal pitch of why you think that agent is the right fit for you. And so I entered into, it ended up being a little over a year and a half where I was writing these query letters and sending, it feels like you're putting your heart out on the silver platter for people just to reject. And that's what happened. I got 60 rejections. Woo. Oh, that. so let, let me tell you right there. Um, first off, good job with the 60 because um, when you're a writer, and again, listeners to the podcast, you probably heard me and uh, some of the other writers talk about this, but Rejection is just expected, right? It comes with the territory. And like you said, Rachel, before you can actually go to the publishers, there's this first essential step where you need to get an agent. And that is very tricky as well for, for reasons that we'll get into in just a little bit. But I, I would let you know, Rachel, that this was such a common topic for us Anselm folks that I was proposing we have like a, 
uh, a rejection meter where like every person that rejects you, you get like you get like a points and we have like a point system we see who can win the most like 60 that that is a very impressive number and i commend you for it <laughs> but uh but before we get to that part i there, there's like this i want to take like a half step back to see your thought here because when you decide to get something published there there's like these the sh- decision trees right these these branching paths the first mm-hmm. path could be do i just self publish and in first a lot of people that's a good option and there are good reasons to do that or do mm-hmm. i seek like an outside publisher so it looks like you eventually chose the outside publisher as opposed to self publishing well why did mm-hmm. you land on that Oh, great question. I think in the end, when I prayed about it, I was like, okay, God, it feels like there's this invitation to publication, which even even that journey of getting, okay, I'll kind of go a few steps back. Um, most of the time as I was writing Moon Thief, I was, I had this thought of like writing as a selfish endeavor. It felt like something, I think maybe because I had felt called to missions at such a young age. So I kind of had this box, I box view. So for a long time, writing in my head was this kind of selfish pleasure. So, and I knew I had the concept of like, God is with me and everything I'm doing. Had heard all the different sermons, believed it, taught it. But for whatever reason in my head, writing still was this like sliver of my life that God was okay that I engaged in, but wasn't actually proud of me for. Um, and so even leading up to this, this whole, okay, what am I going to do with publication? The Lord did this crazy work in my heart of shifting from writing is selfish to actually believing that God wanted to use my writing to impact people, um, which I look back and I'm like, God, you did a miracle there in my heart because I, I can see where my thought process was before and now where it is now. So there's, there's just this crazy faith that God wants to use stories that he wants to use Moon Thief to impact people, to bring light, to bring hope in specifically a genre that doesn't have a lot of light and hope right now. Um, so, so the Lord did that journey in my heart. And then there was just there was just kind of this, this faith for publication and not just self-publication, which for whatever reason, when I prayed about, it felt like I could, I could self-publish, but it wouldn't be it felt like settling in a sense, which I've talked to so many people and like the Lord leads them to that. And that's, that's beautiful. And so not that nothing against self-publishing at all. Honestly, there are some areas where I think that's even harder in certain spheres, um, different things. I have much admiration for those who've self-published. Um, but for me, it, it felt, it felt like the Lord was lighting, inviting me into publication and not just self-publication. So all right. So now let's talk about the the next step here. So the next sort of branch in the in the tree here. So and again, listeners to the podcast, you probably heard us talk about this dynamic because a lot of storytellers, a lot of artists and in, in you know, Anselm type circles, we have this conundrum where our work is not Christian as a marketing term, but it is informed by our Christian faith and that can make it difficult to put out there to the world because they, they want to put it in one or the one or either box from what i understand of moon thief i'm guessing yours probably fits in the same category so did you ever think okay i'll go to a christian publisher or was it always like no it doesn't work there what, what was your thought process with that um oh good question in the end which the the genre of christian Christian publication and Christian stories and Christian fantasy, it's kind of like, okay, what what exactly what exactly is the definition of it? And when I look at Moon Thief, it's not it's not like I started out and it's like, I've got these great Christian themes that I want to promote. And like, these are even where, when we see, which this wasn't Lewis's intent, but we see in Narnia that like, okay, Jesus is Aslan. Like it's the symbolic figure. Like there's no, there's no Jesus figure in, in Moon Thief. Um, but it just, it was a story that was rattling around in my head that I couldn't, I couldn't shake. And I kind of, it felt like I had to write it. And then because it was me writing it, there are Christian themes and there are, there are truths with a capital T that 
have come through, not because I was like, this is something I want to be in this story, but just because it's what the Lord was doing in my heart. And it kind of overflowed. Um, a huge part of the main character, her name's Eilis, huge part of Eilis's journey in the book is a is a journey of self-discovery and discovering that her worth isn't actually in what she does, which is a huge part of my story over the past few years of learning like, okay, I can try and do a bunch of great things and it's not going to change my identity. It's not going to change who I am. Um, so wh- why Eilis starts off on this adventure is feeling like she needs to prove herself and then realizing like, whoa, my family loved me before any of this. Um, and I don't need to prove this. Um, even there's a theme in it of in Moon Thief of different cultures and valuing different cultures, which has come from, I've been all over the world now and seen God in so many different nations. I've looked into different people's faces and seen God's character, seen his nature through these different cultures. We're all, we're all created in his image. Each one is so beautiful and so diverse. Um, so there's a huge value of seeing the differences in different cultures. So Oh, getting back to your original question, I think I I looked into a few things like, okay, what would it look like to present it to a Christian publisher? But also I didn't want, I kind of wanted it to reach a bigger audience. And if it's underneath this Christian publishing title, then I knew there would be quite a few teen girls who'd be like, oh, this book isn't for me because it's it's Christian. Um, and if I'm honest right now, my biggest faith for Moon Thief is believing that God's going to use it to impact teen girls who maybe have never heard the gospel before and have never heard that, they, that their worth is in them alone and in what God speaks over them and not in what they do. And not that, not that Moon Thief says that straight out. But it carries those values. And I've, I've got this crazy faith and this crazy hope that God's going to use it, which I think if it was under, like, okay, this is just a Christian book, Christian YA fantasy, I think you'd miss part of it. Yeah, that. and that answer is really resonating with me as well. And related to that is the area that you are publishing in. And as, as you mentioned, so you're, you're doing YA and specifically YA fantasy. So little, little background for, for listeners who may not have, uh, you know, listened to earlier podcasts on the subject. So we're talking YA, we're us- we're meaning the core audience, right? And usually it's teenagers. So high school students up through college, maybe a little bit of middle school. And usually that in turn is determined by the age of the, the main character, the protagonist. So Almost always in a YA book, it's the lead character is going to be a teenager. Mm -hmm. Now, that all sounds very simple and innocent enough, but the YA sphere, and particularly some aspects of YA fantasy, are kind of a rowdy place on the internet and uh, should not be entered lightly. So (laughs) I wanted to see your your experience with that and what it was like coming there with, with, with this new book. Yeah. Oof. Right now, if I'm honest, seeing where YA fantasy is, it, it honestly hurts my heart because um, this this is what a lot of our youth are reading and engaging in. And, and like you said, there's a lot. Most of the stories are tinged with a lot of darkness. And even I learned a new word over the past few months. Um, it's called spice. And it's used to refer to like sexual content in fantasy, in books in general. And most of the YA fantasy, they're described as these books with lots of spice. Um, and that's what readers are wanting. That's what readers are engaging with. And my heart is just aching because I'm like this. In my own life, I've seen the power of story. And I think we all can look back at our lives and see and mark out the different stories that impacted us, whether it was our dad telling a story over the dining room table or hearing a story on a stage from a pastor or a podcast or the books that we read or the movies that we watched. Like We are impacted by the stories that we hear. Um, even my own missions journey, Like I can mark back when I first said yes to the Lord in missions and it was from reading a book by Jim Elliott and Amy Carmichael, like these greats in missions who they told their story and then my life was impacted and changed by it. So we, 
We as humans are are so impacted by the stories that are around us. And even I could go on for so long about this, but we look at the life of Jesus. He one third of his teachings are parables. They're stories. He's using story to present this message, which just I think shows the power, the power of story. And so just to see where YA fantasy is right now and the the darkness and the just overall, even like the sense of hopelessness that leads to a lot of, um, from my experience, I've seen that it leads to a lot of even self-hatred of people of thinking like, okay, if I'm not this, then like I am nothing. Like there, there's nothing here. Um, so huge, a huge hope for me is that, which Moon Thief is very different. Um, there's, there is no spice. Um, but there is a love interest, but even that is, is very mild in book one. Um, and it's, it's very clean. My dad, as a football <laughs> coach, this will show you how stern he was with language. He didn't let any of his football players on the football field cuss. And so, like we growing up, like language was a was a big thing for us. Words. There was one time I have a, I have such a strong memory. I said the word hate when I was I think I was like four or five, and my mother paused what she was doing, looked me in the eyes, and said, "Rachel, hate is a strong word. When you say it, make sure you mean it." Like to this day, when I say the word hate, I'm like. Do I mean it? So it's like in in the Shinnick family, we we steward we steward our mouths wisely. Um, and so it is it is very clean on multiple aspects, and I think that's refreshing. And I hope I hope it's refreshing to people who read it. Um, so yes, I can't remember what your original question was, but I think I got there in the end. <laughs> yeah, and those are all some really really interesting points. And uh, uh, listeners. You may have heard me talk about this, but I, I, I have a fantasy middle grade book that's coming out soon, August 2024, to, to keep a lookout for it. But for a while, I toyed around with making it YA. That's sort of how I originally conceived it. And I decided to go down to middle grade because I thought a lot of the themes of YA were a little too gritty for, for what I was looking at with, with my story. So what, what you're talking about the genre really really does resonate with me there. And, you know, of course, you know, there, there's some really, really great YA fantasy books. I'm sure me and you could both list out a, a whole bunch that are great. But there are a lot of problems that you'll see pervasive in the genre where it almost seems like a race to the bottom to be darker and more nihilistic and grittier than the one before, right? So in... In that world, I, I remember when I was yeah. trying to look out and sending query letters, I'm, I'm looking at all these agents who represent all these books. I'm like, do they want someone like me? Like, am I like the one of these things that's not like the other here? Did, did, did you experience something like that? And what, what was your approach to it? Oh, yes. A hundred percent. Um which even going back to the queries, <laughs> when you said like, oh, 60, like we, we have a score of like, that ranks you up. I'm like, oh, that's that's such a sweet encouragement. Because even when when I was getting the rejections, mm -hmm. I the first one I got, I ended up bawling and crying, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. They rejected me, and then I was like, I have to find something to where I'm not an emotional wreck after every rejection. Because I knew I knew this path would include many. So I ended up I printed out every rejection and I would hang it up on the back of my wall. And it was like this declaration of like, this is my light bulb. Thomas Edison had so many light bulbs that didn't work. This is one agent that isn't the right one. And I would like <laughs> stamp them on the back of my door. I have pictures. It was just littered with all of these rejection letters. But in it, you do. You look for different agents who are like, okay, what is something that's kind of similar to my work? Which is how I ended up finding um, how I got published. So fast forward through the story, I never actually got an agent. Um, I published through Future House Publishing, which I sent my manuscript to them thinking, I don't, I think I must have just had a busy day. So missed publishing in their name, but I thought they were actually just an agency site. And they had said that they liked books like Brandon Sanderson, which Overall, Brandon Sanderson, his fantasy is really clean. I was like, okay, like this is like this is his world building is beautiful. So I'd kind of used him as some of my comp titles, like, okay, my works are kind of like this. And so they they said they wanted clean fantasy like Brandon Sanderson. And I'm like, oh yes, this is me. So I submitted it to them thinking 
that they were an agent, which again, not sure how I missed it because it's literally Future House Publishing in the title. Um, and then they replied back like, hey, we love your manuscript. We'd love to set up a call with you. And I looked at them and I looked them up and I'm like, oh, wait, this isn't this isn't just an agent. Like this is a, a publishing company. <laughs> Um, so beautiful little story there. And I've had, I've had a great experience with them They're They've, they've been a beautiful team to partner with alongside, and they even have a huge value of, of clean fantasy. And so there are certain things that they did not want that I'm like, Oh, this is great. I don't want that either. That, that <laughs> so, is so interesting. So not only uh, do you yeah. bypass the agent, but you go right to the publishing phase. It's like you, you pass level one and went straight to, to the final boss. Uh, that that's, that's the ultimate dream. <laughs> yeah. It was accidental. <laughs> Lord's favor. <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and you've you've touched on this a little bit, but let's uh, let's talk about your publishing house. You know, let's uh, you you can be the good uh, the good company person and and talk talk it up. What what have been the advantages that you've noticed uh, for the publishing house that you landed at? Yes. Oh well, first off, the people that I've connected with, like my project manager and the marketing coordinator, they've been so kind and so supportive. And even they read it and got excited. They were like, "We can't wait for for Moon Thief to be published and to see how it does." So first off, on a personal level, they just connected really beautifully, and I'm so so thankful for them. Um, and then secondly, because they're a little bit of a smaller publishing company, they're more flexible. Which so writing is not my full time gig. I'm full time in mission. So have a full 40 hour workload, sometimes more with different traveling trips. So writing still is fitting into kind of the in-between moments. I'm being more intentional now that book one is published and I have lots of people wanting book two. Um, but it still is, it's not my full gig, full-time gig. And they are really flexible with that. And really, they're like, we want you to be confident in the story that you're publishing it. So whatever that looks like, like we'll work with your schedule which if I'm honest, was one of my biggest fears in publishing. I'm like, God, if I sign with a big publishing company, it's going to be like, this is the deadline and you have to make it. And I'm like, I'm, I know I'm supposed to still be in missions right now. Like I can't, I'm not saying no to this. Um, and so I was curious how God was going to do that. And then working with Future House Publishing, they've been so kind and so flexible and just so supportive the whole way through. So super thankful for them. Awesome. Awesome. So now that we've reached the end of the publication journey, so, well, at least for book one, l- let's talk a little bit more about the books uh, in themselves. So you you touched on this a little bit where the first book that is already out, and listeners, I hope you're, you're checking it out already, is Book Thief. But that is book one in the Book Thief series. So tell us a little bit about the plots and... Uh, you know the, the the teaser elevator pitch version, right? Don't give anything too important away of of book th- of uh, Moon Thief, and then where you see this going throughout the the subsequent books in the series. So the kind of story arc of Moon Thief is putting the moon back together again. So the world you enter into the beginning chapters of Moon Thief, and the world is ending because the sun is scorching the land, but no one really knows why. But there's this myth of like, oh, the moon was once in existence, which is on a side note is kind of funny. I wrote a whole world where my characters have no idea what the moon even is. They think it's just a myth. And me as a lover of the moon, I'm like, how did I how did I do that to my characters? Like growing up, not knowing what the moon is, like, how dare I? Um, but I, I built a whole whole lore built off of the moon, which is fun. Um, so book one, they're they're trying to set about saving saving the world from the scorching sun by putting the moon back together um and you think you think it's completed at the end of book one but then the rest of the trilogy it's still trying to save the world by putting the moon back together and that's almost a spoiler but that's as far as i'll go so (laughs) all right so so there's the the elevator pitch great job where you go almost to spoiler but not quite that is the key to to a good synopsis (laughs) so now let's talk about some of the themes because you know we, we discussed already what was different about your book in terms of what what was not in it, right? So some of the you know language aspects, sexuality, sort of this nihilism, hopelessness, darkness. So none of that. So that stuff's all out. But now let's talk about the other side of the coin, right? What what is in the book that you believe sets it apart from other books? Mm. So a huge theme in it, kind of like I mentioned before, is Eilis' journey of, of self-discovery and discovering her self-worth um, and realizing like, okay, I'm I don't need to. 
I don't need to do all these things to prove my worth, but actually it's it's who I am, which is a beautiful journey that Ilis goes on um, in discovering discovering who she is um, and even becoming more comfortable with who she is. Um, so that's a beautiful theme. There's a theme of like friends and just friends coming around and encouraging one another and even learning learning to trust different people and learning to come into um, a close friendship. Um, and then even the cultural aspect of their, their different cultures the way that the world works in Moon Thief is it's a flat world. So there are two different sides. There's what some people call the upper and the under. And then on a different side, they're called different things. Um, and it's two vastly different cultures, um, which even side note, it's so fun to be a writer and to get to be like, okay, how do I want to write a culture? Like what, what are different things I want to insert? So on the upper, the, the whole culture is centered around books and a love for story and a love for the written word word so much so that the heart of their capital is a library and it's just this beautiful it's like my dream library it's in the heart of this mountain stretches on there are thousands upon thousands of books it's where they hold their balls and all these different events like it's it's the heart of their community um the culture in the culture in order like required by law you have to write a book before you die so just little things like that that me as a book lover I'm like this would not work practically in so many ways but it's really fun to write a culture where they're trying to enforce this and like how, how are they doing that um so different things like that but so there are these two vastly different cultures you've got the the culture on the upper where they really value books and then in the under or berries they are a culture that's come together with a bunch of different fantastical creatures all coming together in unity um so you have griffins and centaurs and and elves and dwarfs all coming together to form a nation that is unified but so many different cultures so when you see there's some characters who have only ever been um on the upper and they go down to Barith and they're like wait these mythical creatures who we thought didn't exist like they're they're working in unity and like we've thought they were all monsters and and it's beautiful so even this beautiful theme of different cultures which if i'm honest i think a lot of people view different cultures that way like oh they're they're we keep them off to a distance and like, it's a little scary and we don't know what we think, but then you live among the people and you see their beauty and you're like, whoa, actually I need to learn from them. And they have things that, that I don't understand or that our culture doesn't understand. Um, so there's, there's a beautiful theme of valuing the diversity of different cultures and valuing the beauty that God's placed in each culture that is is his character is his nature in in these different aspects of the world which as someone who has traveled lots and gotten to see so many different parts of the world was just beautiful to like sneak in there and be like yes there's there's beauty there and there's beauty there so I love it and I agree that is one of the sneaky great things about writing where i know like when i'm reading a book there's always things that oh i would have done it a little differently than that that's like wait i can now so it's like this very particular thing it's like all right there we go so i and i i love your description of your world so we're, we're running low on time but i i have to ask so i'm fascinated by your description of the world so it sounds like it's almost like a disc where one side of the disc is the book people and the other side I have the mythical creatures. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Or I consider it like a coin. There's <coughs> you've got two different sides. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then there's, there's the fun of like, okay, how do you get from one side and gravity aspects as Eilis is a pirate. So there's one scene um, without too much spoilers, they go over the edge and it's just this fun, this fun, fantastical scene that it's like, okay, what even are the mechanics? I had to think through like, how would this work? Um, <laughs> that when people were going through and giving me edits, they were like, okay, you don't explain this well. Cause like, I can't see it. So it's like, okay, how do the mechanics work? How would you, if the gravity's doing this, you have a boat, like, how does this work? And so writing, you get to write your own science in a sense of like, this is how it works, which is just, uh, it's, it's fun and tricky, but fun. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. You don't really think about like, well, what what if the Earth was a was a giant coin? What would the grab? Well, these are the solutions that we have to work out. You know, but that that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, so, 
Uh, again, unfortunately, we are running low on time because I do have so many more world building questions I would like to ask you. But uh, for the listeners now, let's uh, again, the author who is joining us here at the table, Rachel Shinnick. Uh, Shinnick is spelled S H I N N I C K. The book is Moon Thief. So, Rachel, where can we find you? Where can we find Moon Thief? Yes. Well, I'm on Instagram and I recently joined TikTok, which is a new, a new, um, whole new world that I'm exploring now. <laughs> um, but on social media, so I'd love to connect with you guys. And Moon Thief is available on Amazon right now. Or if you're in Amsterdam, it's in one bookstore right now. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you again. And listeners, as you all can probably guess, uh, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The fire's down to embers, the customers are trundling home, and you've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. If you have a spare minute or so right now, uh, please rate and review the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll catch you next time.